Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox. I'd like to welcome you to episode 114 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today I'm very pleased to visit with you about my most recent book called Doing Compliance, Design, Create, and Implement an Effective Compliance Program. I go through the book, talk about the chapter structure, and I'll go into a little detail about it, and also talk about where you can purchase it. The episode comes in in about 21 minutes. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and I would like to welcome you to this episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Today, I'm going to focus on my latest book, which is called Doing Compliance, Design, Creation, and Implement, Implement an Effective Anti-Corruption Compliance Program. I was very pleased to uh, publish this book, and... I was able to work through Compliance Week to uh, get this published. One of my goals this year was to uh, publish a book with a real publisher, and Compliance Week graciously offered me the opportunity to do so. So if you're interested in some of the things I talk about, I hope you will go to the Compliance Week website and check out my book. Um, it's um, designed to uh, help you in the doing of compliance. As many of you know, I've written a couple of books, hardbacks, on um, various topics, best practices and lessons learned. And I had a colleague named Mary Flood who works at a um, company called AndroVet, and she challenged me to write a book about doing compliance. Uh, basically what Mary said was, Okay, Tom, you've talked about the lessons you've learned. You've talked about best practices. Now you need to write a book about how do you actually do compliance. So that's what I did. And uh, it came out in October. Uh, it's gotten a couple of pretty good reviews so far, and I think uh, it's uh, been well-received in the compliance community. But what I wanted to do was give you an opportunity to have a one-volume handbook on not only how to do compliance, but really taking the best of current compliance practitioners and their thoughts on how to do compliance. It's certainly one thing for Tom Fox to talk about his thoughts on how to do compliance, but there's a lot of great commentators out there. Some of them blog, some of them write articles, some of them are law professors, some of them are practitioners, some are lawyers, some are forensic accountants, some are CPA types. Uh, and everything in between. So what I've tried to do in this book is take the best of the best and put it in a one volume resource for you. So uh, with that, I thought I might uh, spend a little time going through the book in a little bit of detail. The um, It's designed around the <clears throat> 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program. I think that's important because that's what the Department of Justice listed it in listed in their FCPA guidance of uh, 2012, and I still think it's one of the best formulations to think through what are the steps you need or the building blocks you need for an effective compliance program. As uh, everyone probably knows, the FCPA has been around since 1977, and in 2011, the UK Bribery Act was enacted into law. Uh, which incorporated many of the concepts present in the FCPA, but also made private-to-private -private bribery illegal. Um, in uh, 2013 and 2014, we saw the Chinese government in a very aggressive prosecution of their own domestic anti-corruption and anti-bribery laws convict GSK, GlaxoSmithKline. So um, this stuff is here to stay, and everyone in the compliance field understands that. But the question is, how do you comply with all of these laws, all of the various anti-bribery and anti-corruption laws, even the three that I named? Well, in this uh, one-volume text, I think uh, I have laid out for you a method to think through a compliance program that any of these regulators will uh, take a look at and seriously respect. So with, uh, with that, um, the book uh, in it, I don't really talk about the underlying basis of the FCPA or anti-corruption and anti-bribery legislation. I assume that uh, 
you either have a, a good knowledge of those, but there's also a wide variety of books. The FCPA professor, for instance, has written extensively on the underlying basis for the FCPA. So uh, I can't really say how to do compliance because, as we all know, Dove Seedman um, at LRN may sue everybody who uses the word how. Nevertheless, uh, the book is doing compliance, and as the title indicates, it's the, the doing of compliance in a corporation. So compliance begins at the top, and everyone understands its tone at the top. Uh, everyone's heard that buzzword. But how does a company truly get the message of compliance down through the ranks? In the first chapter of uh, this book, I discuss the techniques management can use to move the message of compliance down through um, middle management and into the lower ranks. So as Mike Volkoff is wont to say, it's not only uh, tone at the top, tone in the middle, but also the message of the tone at the bottom. Chapter number two. What is the backbone of your compliance program? Well, the backbone should consist of written standards and controls, where you have a code of conduct, a compliance policy, and implementing procedures. In chapter two, I discuss what uh, should be in the written basics of your compliance program and how best to implement these controls. In chapter three, I, I turn my focus to the chief compliance officer, the role and function uh, in an organization. If your company does not have a chief compliance officer, uh, it's sorely behind the eight ball, but it's way beyond simply naming a CCO uh, to meet any kind of minimum standard now. So I take a look at the compliance function, its oversight, its autonomy, and the resources a company will dedicate to uh, compliance. This, the, uh, the resources is becoming a more of a key area that the Department of Justice and the SEC will review when uh, determining whether a CCO or a chief compliance officer is allowed to fulfill his role. Are there adequate monetary resources? Are there adequate employees in your compliance function? If you're a $20 billion company and you have seven people in your compliance function, is that enough? If it is, how do you justify that or how do you document that? So um, resources is becoming a more and greater question that the Department of Justice has taken a look at. It's not something we've really focused on a lot previously, but I think uh, going into 2015, that's a question you need to take a look at. But beyond the resources, do, uh, does the chief compliance officer have the autonomy and support in the corporate environment? Does the board of directors exercise appropriate oversight over not only the chief compliance officer, but the compliance function as well? And finally, uh, I talk about the structuring of the best practices for the compliance function for your company. In Chapter 4, I go into the cornerstone uh, of what I think the Department of Justice will call the cornerstone of your compliance program, which is your risk assessment. And it really all begins here with your risk assessment. A risk assessment is the roadmap for managing your risk. The implementation of an effective compliance program is more than simply following a set of accounting rules or providing effective training. Compliance can touch many areas of your business, and you need to not only figure out what your highest risks are, but you need to marshal your efforts to mediate or ameliorate those risks. If you don't know what your risks are, you can't deliver a risk management solution. So a risk assessment is designed to provide a big picture of your overall compliance obligations and then to identify areas of high risk so you can prioritize your resources to tackle those. And in this chapter, I take a, really take a close look at uh, the different things you need to look at in a risk assessment, but um, how you evaluate those. So um, this is an important chapter, and I hope uh, that you would uh, gain some important insight into what really is the cornerstone of your compliance program. Once you have designed and implemented your compliance program, you've got the building blocks in place. Now it's time to really do the work. This is where the rubber hits the road. And in Chapter 5, I talk about training, uh, how you train your, your compliance program, and the continuous advice that a compliance practitioner or a compliance professional really wants to um, go with uh, um, going forward. 
you've got to have that subject matter expertise and you've got to have that available to answer the day-to-day questions that companies may have on compliance. <clears throat> but another pillar of a strong compliance program is properly training your company officers, employees, and third parties on the relevant laws, regulations, your corporate policies, and the prohibited conduct. Merely conducting annual training is, is no longer enough. Enforcement officials want to be certain that the message messages in training is actually getting through to employees. So you may have to do some follow-up assessment or follow-up testing. The Department of Justice's expectations for the effectiveness are measured by who a company trains, how the training is conducted, and how often the training occurs. So in Chapter 5, you'll learn about how to get the message of compliance out there to your employees. This is another area where risk assessment comes into play because your risk assessment should tell you who are the high-risk employees who need your highest level of training. And the highest level of training generally is recognized as in-person live training. So your risk assessment can be used in a variety of ways, <clears throat> certainly in setting up your training program is one of them. Uh, on chapter number six, uh, we begin to take a look at some of the specific tools that you can implement in your compliance program. Any effective compliance program uses a wide variety of tools, and the Department of Justice here specifically focuses on both the carrot and the stick. The carrot is what are your incentives for doing business in compliance ethically and under your code of conduct and appropriate compliance policies and procedures, but also the stick of punishment. So do you punish employees who violate your code of conduct, who violate your compliance program, who violate your compliance procedures? Is the discipline progressive? Does it, can it lead up to and include discharge? Have you ever disciplined an employee? These are all important questions that you will need to uh, have for your report. Um, this is one of the ways, both with incentives and discipline, that you can burn compliance into the DNA of your company. Um, but it really doesn't stop, stop with discipline. Uh, clearly that's been uh, around for a long time, but companies need to understand that you can influence behavior in many ways more with a positive or the carrot approach. So do you have uh, compliance incentives built into your um, pay system uh, in your discretionary bonus? How about in your promotion system? How about when you move an employee from middle management into senior management? Is there compliance uh, work or they're doing business ethically and in compliance, is that in any way analyzed? So in chapter six, you'll learn about uh, how to structure compliance into the fabric of your company, beginning with the hiring process where you can really begin to educate and have a conversation about compliance and through the promotion of uh, personnel committed to compliance and how to reward them for doing business ethically in compliance with the FCPA and in compliance with your code of conduct and compliance policies and procedures. Chapter seven, third parties. Clearly one of, still one of the largest bugaboos in FCPA compliance. And um, in this, I talk about what I believe are the five steps of life cycle management of third parties. And I go into some detail here because as many know, it's been estimated that well over 90% of all compliance enforcement actions involve third parties. Therefore, uh, I think it's important that anti-corruption programs manage this highest risk. These five steps, of course, uh, are the business justification, the questionnaire, the underlying due diligence, the evaluation of the due diligence, and then the execution of the contract, all ending with the management of the relationship after the contract is signed. I also take a look at uh, various types of third-party relationships, including agents, distributors on the sales side. I talk about how to think through a compliance program for your sales uh, in the sales chain, in vendor management in the supply chain, or from the sales chain rather, to vendors uh, in your supply chain. So there's a wide variety of um, uh, concerns in this, this chapter. I think it's the longest chapter in the book. Clearly it's uh, viewed as still one of the highest risks in FCPA compliance. So uh, this is a chapter that you'll certainly want to take a look at. Uh, in chapter eight, 
I talk about the best practices for setting up internal reporting and investigating claims of compliance violations. Uh, in this day and age, with the SEC whistleblower program, with uh, NSA oversight, uh, with ongoing investigations, with industry sweeps, with uh, supplemental and uh, uh, DOJ investigations ongoing, I think it's absolutely critical that you have in place a program to keep abreast of concerns, information, and any anything else that your own employees can bring to you. This means that you need to design and implement a system of confidential reporting to get your employees to identify these issues, then have an effective internal investigation of any employees brought to you. In many ways, your own employees are your best defense from preventing a compliance issue becoming an FCPA issue. Indeed, yesterday, uh, Bruce Carton had a uh, webinar on SEC reporting, and the new normal now is 120 days. That's the time that the SEC expects a information of a whistleblower allegation uh, starting uh, getting to the compliance function or being reported rather to the company concluding an investigation. In the corporate world, uh, everyone out there who works understands 120 days is really not a lot of time. So you need to have a protocol in place so that when information comes in, it is triaged appropriately and then acted on. Uh, one of the things that the Department of Justice, and particularly though the SEC, because of the Dodd-Frank whistleblower provision, is really taking a look at is, uh, was the allegation treated seriously? Uh, it turns out that I think the numbers show between 75 and 80 percent of all whistleblowers who go to the SEC actually reported the allegation internally first. So this is something that uh, companies need to understand as a, uh, a key element. And really nothing looks worse than having an allegation brought forward and for whatever reason it was not treated seriously by your own uh, internal investigative team. Uh, this, this really sets you and your company up. So the internal investigations, internal reporting, all very important now. Uh, I really can't say enough about this, um, particularly in light of uh, the Dodd-Frank whistleblower. So once you uh, have everything up and running, you still need to oil the uh, and update the machinery of compliance. In Chapter 9, I tell you how to do this through the steps of continuous improvement. Um, <clears throat> this is using monitoring and auditing to review and enhance your compliance obligations going forward. A company should focus on whether employees are staying with a compliance program, and if so, uh, how, how well are they staying with the program. Even after all the important ethical messages from management uh, have been communicated to the appropriate audiences and key standards, there uh, still could be a question of whether company employees are adhering to your program, and that's something that you need to document for the regulators going forward. Uh, of course, monitoring is taking a shallow dive of data, but a very broad amount of data. And ongoing monitoring is becoming a more focused and important part of your compliance program. Previously, companies had uh, tried to simply get by with auditing, which is a much more deep dive, but a narrow focus. And having that um, complementary functions of monitoring and auditing is where best practices has gone. This is something that the Department of Justice has made very clear and something that you need to consider as part of your compliance program going forward. Uh, in the final chapter, based upon the 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program, I talk about uh, mergers and acquisitions under the FCPA. Uh, clearly, we've had a lot of information over the years about the post-acquisition integration, uh, audits, and remediations companies need to do. Uh, in this, uh, this spring, excuse me, this fall of 2014, we had Opinion Release 1402, which together with the FCPA uh, guidance really focused our attention more on the pre-acquisition uh, phase of FC, uh, for FCPA compliance. It's clear that companies need to critically take a look at uh, or perform adequate compliance due diligence in any pre-acquisition phase. Companies simply don't buy FCPA violations. Every time there's been liability from 
a acquisition, it's because a company allowed the conduct to continue after the uh, acquisition was made. And really, it's in the pre-acquisition phase that you can identify the conduct and disclose it to the Department of Justice or SEC as appropriate to try to protect yourself so much. So uh, these are really the, the 10 chapters that are based upon the um, FCPA guidance. Uh, I've got, uh, I conclude with a chapter on facilitation payments. Uh, what are facilitation payments? How can you use the facilitation payment defense? Uh, I don't think it's really that difficult to understand what it is. Some commentators have, have tried to suggest that, but it's relatively straightforward. It's a small, small payment to get a non-discretionary act done uh, quicker than it would have been done normally. So if you're uh, going through customs, if you're going through um, passport control, that's a facilitation payment. If you're asking for a change in a tax ruling, if asking for change in tax status, uh, and you're paying several thousand dollars, that's not a facilitation payment. Even if you book it as a facilitation payment. And that brings up the other problem most companies have is they don't accurately book facilitation payments. So those are some of the things uh, that I talk about in the book. Once again, it's designed to really provide practical advice to you. Uh, so I try to be the nuts and bolts guy, and I try to give you information on that, um, those topics. So uh, that really sums up uh, the book, and I hope that you will um, consider taking a look at it. You can, like I said, get it on uh, Compliance Week. If you go to the Compliance Week website, uh, it's listed um, <clears throat> under Thought Leadership and In-Depth Reports. Uh, so go to that, uh, that link, and it takes you to uh, my book. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have about the book. It is not, uh, um, or rather, it's, it's, like I said, designed to be a one-volume text of the most current and best thinking of the actual doing of compliance. So uh, this is Tom Fox. If you have any questions or want to get in touch with me, you can do so at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. And I look forward to visiting with you on the next episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. Thank you.